uh, are just here to worship and you are there wherever you are to worship, I hope you have Jesus on your heart this morning and are ready to lift him up as we gather right now in a different way than we have before. Lord Jesus, we invite your presence into our lives right now. A lot of times we've set into this place, but Lord Jesus, we're in a lot of different places today. And so we invite your presence to just join us and join us together wherever we are. We ask, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will just enter every home and every place that people are right now joining us. We ask that you would speak into their hearts and lives and touch them through your power and great glory. You would help us as we worship together here across Lincoln County, across Washington State, and even around the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for touching us right now and being with us. In Jesus' name.
you're with us wherever we're at. We pray for Leah right now. We're not sure exactly where she's at, but we know you know. And we're asking you to bring her safely home. Thank you for providing a new direction as we have seen just in the last uh, moments that she uh, probably can return safely home. We pray for Byron right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for miraculously rescuing him this week. We ask that you to uh, take care of all the needs of that airplane that he flies around in every day and that you would have that repaired for him. We thank you for that. We ask you to bring him safe. Lord Jesus, we pray for our nation right now. We ask, Lord Jesus, that your hand of protection would be upon us, that your healing power would come over this country and this world in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come against the coronavirus right now. We ask, Jesus, your healing touch, your miraculous healing power to reach out. We ask that you protect each one of us, keep us safe from it, in Jesus' name. And we give you praise. Lord, we ask that you take care of every need that we might have, every person watching uh, and being with us here today has some sort of need. We ask that you take care of those because you're the Lord our provider, you're the Lord our healer, you're our savior. Someone asked me just uh, just before we started this morning, asked if uh, I would feel better if I had more of an audience, and uh, apparently they don't know me very well because uh, this would be really awesome preaching to empty pews, and uh, it'd be different. But uh, it's what I always hoped for. <laughs> Joking, right? And I'm thinking there were so many things that went through my mind during the course of this week, like. Uh, I remember the television program, Captain Kangaroo, and he said, I see Johnny and Billy and Mary and Kim. You know, I had to say that because he never did say Kim. And I, I was like, uh, why does he ever say my name when he's looking into that camera? And how come he doesn't see me? <laughs> but, uh, well, here we are. Uh, someone out there on the internet put it this way. We've had quite a year in the last week. And uh, I think that that might be it. And uh, just thinking about the needs of a lot of people that are out there, for us introverts, this is absolutely awesome. The world is finally as it should be. Stay away from me and mind your own business. Everything's cool. For you extroverts out there, like I'm thinking of Ed and Ed and our son Nick, probably should call them, text them, see how they're doing, because without uh, social interaction, they're probably going just a little bit crazy. So take care of your extrovert friends. Your introvert friends, you don't need to worry about them. They're fine. They're having a great time. And everything's as it should be. I, I want to say uh, uh, one other thing. Um, I, th this has just brought me back to uh, just so many things. Uh, uh, for the, and this will be an inside joke for just a few of us. Uh, you can send all your tithes and offerings to the church, Post House Box 909, Spokane, Washington, 99210. Not just teasing. That was Reverend Eugene W. Dowdle from when we were kids. And uh, that's don't remember that address, okay? I don't even know if that address is still effective. It, you can send in your tithes and offerings. And somebody asked me about this. Uh, P.O. Box 670, 670, P.O. Box 670, Davenport, Washington, Harvest Celebration Church. And since there might be somebody watching,
something that actually usually uh, attends another church. We don't want your tithes. Oh, well, that may not be true. We have a right church, true. Okay. We don't want your tithes. You should be sending your tithes to your church. And even if you're attending by Facebook Live this morning our church, you should be sending your tithes to the church that you generally go to in your geographic area, a place where they minister to you. Uh, so take care of your home church, but take care of your tithes. Uh, it's the one thing in all of Scripture. God in all of Scripture says, and he usually says, don't test me. But there's one thing, one area where he says, test me in this and see. And that one area is tithes. And uh, over the years, I've had people tell me, oh, tithing is an Old Testament thing, it's not a New Testament thing. And, and I go, well, just test God in it. Test him for three months. I've been 39 plus years of ministry. I have never had anyone that truly tested him in that and regretted it or said that it didn't work. And so if it's an Old Testament thing, still works because it's still scripture. <laughs> but I'm convinced it's a New Testament thing too. Want to remind you about Wednesday evenings at 730. We're on Facebook Live too. Um, and uh, for the young people, the youth are joining the armory with Cooley City Assembly of God. And they're meeting online a couple of times a week beside that. So uh, with with Sharon. So stay tuned for more info about that. And uh, uh, here we are. We're reaching outside the walls while being trapped behind them. It's really an interesting thing. So our, our sign outside says, come as you are. <laughs> but actually, that's the only way to come to Jesus. And uh, just wanted to remind everybody of that. And then uh, our, our youth are studying a book called Do Hard Things. And this is a great time to practice it. And uh, uh, Sharon has put together, uh, or there it's upside down. <laughs> I'll read it upside down from the other side. It says, hello, let me know if you need help. And then it has a slot, my name is Trey Smith. And my phone number is, I'm gonna tell you that. I live in the neighborhood and uh, it says on there, it gives a whole bunch of options for things that you might need and Trey is just looking for things to do. He would love to do some hard things for you. And uh, so if you're out there and need some help, you can, uh, uh, we're, we're hoping that Trey and maybe Kale and some of the other people will take these little papers around and put them on, uh, on doors uh, at homes around the town. And uh, if someone needs something, I saw a lady, a lady walked by yesterday and I was doing some cleaning on my pickup and she says, when you're done there, could you come up to my house? And, and I said, well, you know, um, really don't want to wash your car necessarily, but if you really do need something, don't be afraid to come down and knock on my door. And uh, she said, well, my husband, well, he can't do anything because he does COPD. And I said, hey, I'll come by. If you just, if you need anything, so let me know. So, and that follows right with our, how I usually start my sermons. Our mission statement, sharing hope through serving Jesus by serving others. And so, we would like to do hard things and keep doing hard things. Keep sharing hope by serving people. And apparently now we need to serve people at a distance. And, uh, but we're, we're willing to do that because our attitude needs to be the same as that of Jesus Christ. And his attitude was that of a servant. We can do that because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And that is a powerful Holy Spirit. And uh, he quickens us to do that. And then I remind everybody, you know what? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And uh, if we will do those things, then at some point in time, a man named Jesus will walk into somebody's life, and it might be through your life doing that. Well, as we're uh, into this worldwide event, I uh, the first thing that I just 
just felt like I should share with everybody, and it's something that's been on my heart since before Christmas time. And interestingly, my son, who uh, is a youth pastor over at Cooley City, he has been, the same thing has been getting his heart. I preached on it just actually just a few weeks ago, the most frequent promise in all the Bible. I will be with you. Um, we, we often think if I ask somebody what's the most frequent promise in the Bible, they go, they, they're, I've heard people say a lot of different things. Well, it must be that Jesus says he will forgive our sins or uh, something else. But no, the most frequent promise in all the Bible is I will be with you. We were just singing, because you're with me, I will not fear. And I want to talk about that for just a few minutes. And uh, um, even though I've been speaking on it for the last several months, and it's come into my heart, and it's been on my heart, and, and even though it's kind of come into almost every sermon for the last several weeks, I, just, I think it's uh, really important for us right now to realize that God is with us. God is with us. It's the whole point of everything. In fact, in Ezekiel 48, I think it's the last verse of Ezekiel 48, he gave himself a name. The Lord is there. In other words, if you go to this next place, the Lord is there. If you go, wherever you go, the Lord is there because that's his name. He is omnipresent, but not just in that way. He is present where we are through the power and anointing of his Holy Spirit. The Lord is there. It's his name. It's the name he gave to himself. I talk about the name, the Lord our healer, the Lord your healer. Exodus 15, 26, it's a name he gave to himself. And the Lord is there is one of his most important names. And it's what it, it, everything there is. I was reminded overnight. And uh, amazingly, through all of this, it's kind of like for me, anxiety has just lifted. I... I have been anxious for the last decade about who knows what. And now, look who's laughing. I didn't know. I, I could say more there. But in, in the last few days, I've been just like, wow, God's got it all in control. And I can truly cast all my anxiety on him because he cares for me. First Peter 5, 7. It's all there. And Matthew eleven twenty eight, he says, Come to me, all you are who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Go to Jesus. He's there. He's with you. I, I, I'll take you to several places in, in Scripture as we, as we look at this idea of the Lord is with us. And, and, it, and it permeates from the very first chapters of the Bible. This was the whole point of God creating the earth and creating man. He wanted to be with us. And in Genesis 3, 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You see, God was with them. God just walked with Adam and Eve in the very first chapters of the Bible. That was the whole thing. Before, before they committed any sin, before they did anything wrong, God was walking with them and that was what he wanted to do and he wants to walk with you more than you want to walk with him. God is with us and we need to, we need to take a hold of that right now. Because you're with me, I will not fear I've been amazed at our worship team and how they seem to know when I'm going to preach before I preach it. Before I even before I even know, before I have my notes done, they have their list of songs done. And they finish up today with, because you're with me, I will not fear. And I'm talking to you today about the fact that God is with us. And I don't know where exactly geographically you are right now and uh, um, on Wednesday night I was doing this on the computer and I could see people signing in and I, and I could see where a lot of people were all around signing in and uh, 
different ones even signed in and said, hey, I'm in Grand Coulee. And, and there were uh, other people signing in from different places. And before very long, people were with us from all over the place. It doesn't matter where you are geographically. God was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he could be with other people. I um, one of the sec- As you go just a few ch- more chapters into the Bible, in, in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, there's a story of Noah and the great flood. And, and it, it's actually in verse 9 of chapter 6, it says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. What an amazing concept. He, he walked with God. Now, we don't walk with God. It says he was more righteous, blameless among the people of this time. He walked with God. We don't walk with God in our own righteousness. We walk with God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But it was, it was amazing, and it was really important for Noah to walk with God because God asked Noah to do something really, absolutely insane. He, he asked Noah to build an ark. And, and I can say, I've thought about it over the years. I, I thought about it, and, and Noah starts this project. And, and he gets out all of his woodworking tools, his bandsaw and his skill saw and his nail gun and, and all of the other, wait a minute. No, he had some sort of hand saw and an ax and a few other little tools. And he starts, he starts building this ark, this huge ship, there's no other way to describe it. It was absolutely massive. It took him 100 years to build it. All his neighbors are walking by, looking in his yard, saying, hey, oh, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. What's an ark? Well, it, it's, it's a big boat. Why are you building a boat? There's no water anywhere around here. Because it's going to rain. What's rain? Well, it's water falling down from the sky. Because see, the earth was watered by dew at that point in time. They had never even seen rain. They didn't know what that was. And all these people are going by, they're laughing at them for 100 years. Noah walked with God because none of his neighbors did. None, and all of his neighbors were laughing at him. And he needed God walking with him in a time when he felt all alone and maybe sometimes felt really foolish trying to explain to people what an ark is, what the ark was for. And we know that humanity and all of the animals were saved because Noah did what God said and Noah walked with God. Abraham was another one. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, those verses don't specifically say, I will be with you, but they clearly say, I will be with you. He, he says directly, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. In other words, God was going to be walking with him all the time. But the most amazing thing about this is God said, no. And, and here's, here's one of my, my favorite stories in the Bible. And uh, he said, I mean, Abraham, <laughs> talking about Abraham now. He said, Abraham, go rent a U-Haul. Load it with all your goods and stuff. And start driving. And I'll tell you when you get there. Well, of course, we know it was no U-Haul. And he could have rented a U-Haul anyway, not the way you rent a U-Haul now. Because if you rent a U-Haul now, you have to tell them where you're going to stop, where you're going to end up. And he didn't know. God just said, Abraham, take all of your earthly possessions, take your family, everything you have, load it up, and go. And I'll tell you, if you read that whole story, that I'll let you know when you get there. 
I will be with you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will be with you is what he was saying to Abraham. And Abraham, you know what Abraham did? He said, you know what? I can do that. I can go. I can do this thing because you promised to be with me. Another one was just a few chapters later, Jacob. Chapter 28. He said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. He just starts out there in 28.15, Genesis 28.15. I am with you and will watch over you. I think every person watching this can take a hold of that, those words, and know that God will be with us and watch over us, no matter what's going on. Jacob was in a rough time in his life right then. He was fleeing from his brother who he was who, who was determined to kill him at that point in time. Are you getting a, a sense of what's going on? We're in a time of real uncertainty, and I'm taking you through just a few people in the Bible who were in uncertain, difficult times, and God promised to be with them. He didn't. They, they were in uncertain, difficult times. They were in uncertain, difficult situations. They were in danger for their lives. They were, uh, it, everything was, seemed like it was crumbling in some situations and falling apart. This one that I had just read, Jacob thought his brother was going to kill him. Abraham was worried that his dad was probably going to kill him for leaving home. And they were in these uncertain times that we're in right now. And God was promising to be with him. Another one was Joseph. Uh, Genesis 39, 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, it goes on, he put him in charge of everything he had. And, uh, you know what? God was with Joseph in the pit that his brothers threw him into. God was with Joseph, according to this verse, when he was a slave uh, in, in a house in a foreign country that, that he didn't belong in. God was with him after he was a slave in that foreign country. God was with him in prison. And eventually, even the prison keepers moved him up to the highest position in the prison, put in charge of everything, they said, you know what? We're not going to have any trouble with our prisoners because this man has something going on in his life because God was with him. And you know what? God was with Joseph when he was second, raised out of that prison and raised to the point of second person in the kingdom with only Pharaoh being over him. Another one, finally getting out of the book of Genesis, Another one is Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, in verse 11 it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. God was with him in the desert. Right in this situation, God spoke to him. God was with him later on when he was talking to Pharaoh. God was with him at the Red Sea when the people were saying to him, why did you bring us out here to die? We could have stayed in Egypt and they wouldn't be coming to kill us. And God was with him in the desert. And, and if you read through uh, the book of Exodus, God very clearly was with them. He, and it says God was with them in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Those Israelite people had a visual representation of God every day in their lives. They could see God working in them, walking with them, touching their lives. God was there. And you know what? If you look around, and can't see God. 
give me a call and let's talk because God is showing himself to us everywhere. Another one of our favorite stories in all of the Bibles in Daniel chapter 3. And uh, I would remind you of this Wednesday night. Talk about being in a difficult situation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are brought before the king because he said when the music plays, everybody bow down to this idol. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go, now, we're not going to bow down to any other idol, to any God except our God, because God is with us, and he will take care of us. In fact, they said to the king, you know what, do whatever you want to do. If you're going to, you know, punish us however you want to punish us, we're not going to bow down, because God is our God. He can protect us if he chooses to, if he chooses not to. We still won't bow down. And so it made the king so mad that he told his guys to turn the furnace up seven times hotter than normal. The fire was so hot that the men who bound and, and threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, it says they died because of the heat. And then King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace and he said, hey, and to the people who were still alive outside the furnace, he said, hey, I thought we threw three guys into the furnace. How come is it that I see four and one of them looks like the Son of God? Have you ever felt like you're in the fire? God will be with you. He'll walk with you wherever you are. It's the reason that we can walk in courage, that God is with us. Joshua, going back a few books of the Bible now, Joshua 1 8 says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You know what? That was in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua did not have it easy. They defeated Jericho. Then they got defeated at Ai. And there were a lot of different times of testing and trial. But Joshua had that promise that as he began leading those people, that God would be with him. And he could walk through it. And he did not need to be discouraged because God would be with him. Matthew 28. I think this speaks to, to us right now. God was talking to his disciples. Uh, Jesus was very clearly talking to his disciples. And he said, All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. And lo, I will be with you always. We're his disciples. He's still speaking to us. As we go and do what God is asking us to do, as we're moving around, it doesn't matter what is going on. He says, Lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Doesn't matter what's happening, God is going to be with us. And you know what? That's his name Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew 1 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the whole reason Jesus came to earth. To make it so he could be with us. So he could truly be with us again. See, Adam and Eve... And I've said this lots of times in services recently. Adam and Eve messed it up. They made it so we couldn't be with God. Because we were all born into sin. But Jesus came so that we could walk with God once again. So that the sin could be taken away from our lives. He died on the cross to make it so God could be with us. His name was Emmanuel. God with us. When he was here, he was walking. He lived that perfect, sinless life. And if you read through 
the book of Leviticus, and, and you see what it took for a sacrifice, it had to be the perfect, the very best lamb in the whole flock. It had to be the very, very best thing in the entire herd or flock. There could be no flaws or anything, nothing wrong at all to be the sacrifice for their sins. Jesus is that perfect lamb. He's the one. He is, is that perfect lamb. He lived a sinless life so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins so that we could truly be back to that point where God always wanted to be God with us. God with us. If you've never asked Jesus to forgive you your sins, just, it's so simple, it's so easy. You need to do it right now. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's that easy. We just need to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have sin in my life. I need you to forgive me right now. Because I want to be walking with God. It's that easy. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You need to believe in that perfect, spotless Lamb, Jesus Christ. Receive salvation right now and walk. It's that easy. You need to have him walking with you through this time of turmoil and uncertainty. These men in the Bible that I, that I mentioned, they needed God walking with them. And God knew that we needed him. That's why it's the most frequent promise. You know, there's days right now, probably been days this week, where you where you didn't know what you were going to do. Where you were wondering what's going to happen. Well, you know what? I wonder. I wonder what's going to happen. But one thing I do know, God is with me. And no matter what happens, I'm walking with God. And that's what I need to do, is just walk with God. And allow Him walk with me. And so I encourage you, walk with God. He promises that he'll walk with you. But you have that choice. So this morning, today, right now, just ask him to walk with you. God is with us. So I will Thanks for being with us today. Have a, have a great day, great week. Uh, get in touch with us. Uh, if, you, if you have any needs, let us know. We'll pray with you. We want to pray with you and, uh, and see that your needs are met. And if we need to do something physical to take care of those needs, let us know. Thanks for joining us today.